Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of John Leonard Orr? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing him in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, including the timeline of the crimes, then offer my analysis. John Orr was born on April 26, 1949. He grew up in Los Angeles, California. His father owned a sporting goods store there. He had two brothers. When John was 16, his mother traveled to her childhood home in Missouri without telling anyone where she was going. She only said that she would call in a few days. She did not come back to Los Angeles for three years, and even when she did, she never went back with John's father. On career day, when John was a senior in high school, he spoke to a Los Angeles fire department captain who told him that he should learn how to fight fires in the military. It would be good experience if he was interested in a career in fire science. John joined the Air Force and left on his 18th birthday, April 26, 1967. He was eventually transferred to firefighting school. In 1968, he married his high school girlfriend, Jody. After this, he was stationed in Spain at an airport but only responded to two crashes. He didn't get the action he was looking for. He was really hoping more planes would crash on the runway. In 1970, he was transferred to Montana, where he only fought one small fire. He was honorably discharged from the Air Force in April of 1971. In reflecting on his time in the military, John did not like his commanding officers. He really didn't like anybody in a position of authority. He viewed them as arrogant and condescending. He thought that they acted this way in order to compensate for insecurity. John returned to Los Angeles and applied at two police departments and two fire departments. While he was waiting to hear back, his wife gave birth to a daughter. This was June 1971. John's marriage was not in good shape. He would later say that he lacked insight. John was invited to test for the Los Angeles Police Department. He passed all the tests, except for those based on mental health. He was given a Rorschach test and the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, otherwise known as the MMPI. The LAPD sent him a letter saying he was unsuitable. John found his own mental health professional to test him, and that therapist said he was suitable. John confronted the therapist for the LAPD with this second opinion. The therapist was not persuaded. The assessment indicated that John was passive, low in conscientiousness, irresponsible, immature, indecisive, and had problems with women and sex. The MMPI indicated he had schizoid personality. The diagnosis was personality trait disturbance, emotionally unstable personality. John was disappointed that his aspirations to be a police officer went up in smoke, but then he was accepted to test for the Los Angeles Fire Department. He went through the fire academy, but struggled with both the written test and the physical test. He was rejected. Desperate to be a firefighter, he applied to the Glendale Fire Department in January of 1974. Of the 55 fire agencies in Los Angeles County, this one was almost at the bottom as far as pay. He was accepted in March of 1974. John was bored with his schedule as a firefighter, so he took a job working as a clerk at a 7-Eleven. He met another employee there, and they decided to rent an apartment together in Glendale. They would eventually marry. John left a note for his wife, Jody and simply took off, similar to what his mother had done to his father years before. John started studying fire science in college. After catching a shoplifter at the 7-Eleven, he developed a burning desire to work in store security. He eventually landed a part-time job as a security guard at Sears. He was quite successful catching shoplifters, but he took a lot of risks, like chasing people farther than he should have and getting into physical fights. He eventually was able to get a concealed carry permit. Around the fire department and around the police department, John became known as a wannabe cop. The police called him Inspector Clouseau. This is the bumbling detective played by Peter Sellers in the Pink Panther movies. The officers were definitely not paying John a compliment with that reference. John was bored waiting for the fire alarms in the police department. He was transferred to Hill Patrol. He would drive around and look at hills, vacant lots, and other areas, making sure they didn't catch on fire 
and warning people about clearing brush. A major part of his job was writing citations for people who failed to clear brush. John continued to be overzealous. He apprehended people trying to commit arson, as well as other types of crimes, which were completely unrelated to arson. I can picture him trying to connect every crime to arson. That guy wasn't just speeding, he was scorching the road. That person wasn't just shoplifting, they were burning through the store. Like John was really adding fire to everything. John left his second wife and started dating a woman he met at Sears. John was eventually invited to apply as an arson investigator. He took the MMPI again, but this time he passed. Even though it's not really a pass-fail test, I guess the mental health professional felt as though nothing on the MMPI was a red flag. As an arson investigator, he had the authority of a peace officer. He could carry a firearm all the time. John started doing well financially. The Glendale Fire Department had been one of the lowest paid, as I mentioned, but then it became one of the highest paid after the members connected with organized labor. Even though John was technically a law enforcement officer, he really wanted the title of police officer. He felt as though he was somewhere between a firefighter and a cop. He was paired with a police detective who often humiliated him for not being a real police officer and complained when John carried a gun, even though John was allowed to. The detective wondered why an arson investigator needed to have one. Technically, the pair was fairly successful at catching arson offenders. At around this time, John married for the third time. The marriage did not last long. He started actively dating. He gained a reputation for trying to ignite romance with a number of love interests. During this time, Glendale was experiencing a disproportionately high number of arsons. John claimed that it only seemed that way because he was working diligently to identify them correctly. So incidents that would not have been categorized as arson, he was able to spot and identify. This explained the massive increase in the quantity of arsons. This brings us to 1984. There was a fire in an 18,000 square foot hardware store in South Pasadena. Four people were killed in the fire, including a two-year-old child. John was the only arson investigator who believed the fire was intentionally set. Eventually, it was determined that he was correct but the crime went unsolved for quite some time. In 1985, John married for the fourth time. On January 13, 1987, there was a conference for arson investigators in Fresno, California. Not far from the conference, at 8.30 p.m., a fire broke out at a drugstore. Just after this, another fire broke out at a fabric store right across the street. An incendiary device was discovered at a third retail store just a block away. It was made of a cigarette, matches, and a rubber band. I wonder if the first suspect was MacGyver, although he could have built an atomic bomb out of the same materials. On the last day of the conference, two more fires broke out in a town about an hour south, both retail stores. Between 1.45 p.m. and 2.45 p.m. that same day, there were two fires in Bakersfield, California. Similar incendiary devices were found at these other fires. After talking with witnesses at all the different locations, there was no agreement as far as what the suspect looked like. The authorities collected several different distinct descriptions, although everybody agreed that the suspects were men. Another arson conference was scheduled to start on March 5, 1989, this time in Pacific Grove, California. On March 3, two days before, fire broke out in a business about a half hour south of Pacific Grove. The next day, a fire broke out in a retail store not far away from the conference, and on the first day of the conference, there were four more fires nearby. Arson investigators believe that the fires in Fresno were related to the ones near Pacific Grove, like somebody at the conference was the perpetrator. They looked at the list of attendees for people who were at both conferences. One name that stood out was John Leonard Orr, but he was not investigated at that time. John Orr was promoted to fire captain on May 1, 1989, John made $65,000 a year, working just four days a week, had all the overtime that he wanted, and use of a department Ford Crown Victoria. Early the next year, he started writing a novel titled Points of Origin, about an arson investigator looking into a series of arsons. Between December of 1990 and March of 1991, an unprecedented series of arsons occurred in the Los Angeles area. 
Many of the fires were set in retail stores. On March 27 alone, five fires occurred within a two and a half hour time period. The unknown arson offender was named the Pillow Pyro because some of the fires were set in pillows. A task force was formed involving the ATF. They were able to identify John Orr's fingerprint on a piece of notebook paper that was part of an incendiary device. When they realized he was an arson investigator, they initially figured that he simply mishandled the evidence, but then they realized that he may be the one setting the fires. After John was placed under surveillance, he found a tracking device on his car after it slipped into plain view, like it was not installed correctly. He never inquired as to his status as a suspect, so he knew that he was being followed and investigated, but he never bothered to investigate himself as to why that was happening. It would appear as though the ATF was competing for the title of Inspector Clouseau, as they couldn't even correctly install the tracking device on John's car. On December 4, 1991, John was arrested outside his home. He would eventually be charged with five counts of arson. He was tried in 1992, and on July 31, was found guilty of three counts of arson and not guilty of two counts. He was sentenced to 10 years for each count to run consecutively, so this was 30 years in prison. On March 24, 1993, he pleaded guilty to three more counts of arson. This was part of a plea deal. He would be paroled from federal prison in 2002 under this plan. John was indicted by the state of California on November 21, 1994, on four counts of first-degree murder and 21 counts of arson for fires that occurred between 1984 and 1990. The four counts of murder were from that 1984 hardware store fire in South Pasadena that I talked about, the one that John thought was arson, and no one believed him. It appears as though he was the offender who started the fire. On June 25, 1998, John was convicted on all charges except one of the arson counts. For the murders, he was sentenced to four concurrent life sentences without the possibility of parole. For the arsons, he received 21 years in prison. On appeal, his sentence was shortened by nine years. I'm guessing John was inflamed when he didn't qualify for a getting out of jail soon party. Now moving to my analysis. The question of John's guilt was more or less settled with his guilty plea, although one could certainly argue that he was not guilty of certain fires, like the one at the hardware store in 1984 that resulted in four fatalities. There's one part of the case against John Orr which has become controversial. His unpublished manuscript, Points of Origin. It was about an arson investigator chasing an arsonist who was a firefighter. So, one firefighter chasing another. John claimed that the book was just fiction, populated with information that he had gathered because he was an arson investigator, not by knowledge that only the perpetrator would possess. The manuscript was used against him in both trials and appeared to play a key part in the jury's decision. Let's look at some of the similarities between the adventures of the protagonist in the manuscript and the actual arsonist. Both are firefighters who don't smoke. Both used a delay incendiary device designed to ignite 10 to 15 minutes after it was placed. The description of the advice in one version of the manuscript matches the description of the actual devices. Both start fires in retail stores in the Los Angeles area. Both prefer the drapery section of a fabric store and styrofoam products. Both start fires in hardware stores. Both start fires in retail stores that are in close proximity during a short time period. And both were traveling to or from an arson investigators conference. One could argue that John was simply following the case and made some guesses as far as the details. After all, the movie Backdraft was written by a firefighter. No one accused that individual of setting fires. I think what really hurt John was that the manuscript had information that only the perpetrator could have known. It seems unlikely that he was that good at guessing. There's only so much coincidence that can be observed before reasonable doubt is incinerated. One of the big mysteries of this case is motive. There is no agreement on what motivated John Orr. There are many theories about his motivation. In his manuscript, he makes many references to finding fires sexually gratifying, but again, that may have just been fiction. John has never admitted to committing the arsons. Therefore, we will probably never know 
his motive. Here's my theory about what happened. This is just a theory. Of course, I don't know what actually happened. John desperately wanted to be a police officer. He was envious of police officers. He frequently derided them. He tried to turn every job that he had into police work. John had a good job, a good income, but he wanted more. He wanted respect and excitement. He set a number of fires over the course of many years, probably more than those for which he was convicted. Setting fires may have been sexually gratifying for him, but the fires also put his line of work in the spotlight. It made firefighting, and specifically arson investigating, even more important. It glorified his profession above police work. In his manuscript, he talked about how police officers were not smart, and only firefighters could figure out what was happening. So again, we see this competition between firefighters and cops. Moving to the next question, what about pyromania? It's not clear if John had pyromania or not. We know that he was very interested in people who had it. He had arrested at least one person who appeared to have pyromania and questioned her about it. What does the research literature tell us about arson offenders and people with pyromania? Starting with arson offenders. Here's some of the typical characteristics of arson offenders. Low educational level, being unmarried, living alone, being unemployed, having low extroversion, being physically unattractive, having low assertiveness, a prior history of criminality, and a history of mental illness. In this area specifically, a few disorders are overrepresented, like substance use disorders, schizophrenia, and personality disorders, specifically antisocial and borderline. So here we see some alignment with John Orr, but not a great match. Now moving to pyromania. This is a mental disorder. A person can have this disorder without committing crimes. They can set fires that are not arson. Here are the symptom criteria for pyromania. Deliberately setting fires on more than one occasion. Tension or affective arousal before the act. Fascination with fire. Gratification when setting or witnessing fires. The fire setting is not done for monetary gain or to cover up a crime. The behavior is not better explained by conduct disorder, a manic episode, or antisocial personality disorder. The prevalence of pyromania is very low in the population. Technically, it's unknown. It's even low among people who repeatedly commit arson. So most arson offenders do not have pyromania. Comorbidity with the disorder includes substance use disorder, gambling disorder, major depressive disorder, and bipolar disorder. It would appear that John Orr's behavior doesn't really align well with what we know about pyromania. His behavior aligns somewhat with being an arson offender, but not very well with pyromania. What lessons can we learn in this case? Identifying firefighters that will go on to set fires is actually quite difficult and something that frustrates law enforcement. The problem is that a key characteristic that drives somebody to become a firefighter, excitement seeking, is also associated with setting fires. I think the lesson learned here is that it's important to recognize that people in positions of authority and trust can still commit crimes, and often do. When a crime occurs, no one should be automatically excluded as a suspect, even those investigating the crime. Those are my thoughts on the case of John Leonard Orr. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis to be more intriguing than an inferno. Thanks for watching.